Hi, um, my name is Derek and I'm your instructor for the uh, Operating Systems class. Um, today we're going to be going over um, the, a, an example that we use in one of our problem sets, the uh, example where we used the pthreads library in order to have a, a program that you had to um, try and figure out what it was doing. Okay, So if you don't remember, that was this problem from the, the problem set from the previous week. It should have been at the time you're watching this video here. Um, and you had a function that um, um, had a, or you, well, you had a program that had a function um, that was run in a thread that was started with this p3 p thread create. Okay, so um, now that we've learned about semaphores uh, this week uh, and concurrency mechanisms, I kind of want to show you kind of what the problem was in more detail with this uh, problem set question. Uh, and what the solution looks like uh, if you have concurrency mechanisms for mutual exclusion, like a semaphore, okay? Um, so, let's bring up the, the code here and first talk a little bit about uh, what was wrong with that example, all right? So, I'm working with, uh, you had the code, hopefully you guys actually um, uh, compiled and ran this code while you were working on this problem last week um, for the, the problem set. Um, so, in general, let me open up. So the, the one called problem set 02 race is basically the same code that you had in your problem set, although I did kind of change it to using IO stream output instead of the, the old printf kind of output. I think that was the only change that I made to this in here, okay? And, um, you know, so this should work on Windows, assuming that you installed the, um, the pthreads library, okay, so in, in the readme I talk a little bit, but but yeah, you need to, if you're, you should be using mingw um, like I asked for in this class, and so if you have MG, mingw you can run the installer again um, uh, and do a reinstall, although that's a little bit misleading here, so we're not reinstalling, we're just installing the, uh, the pthread, right, so if you install the find the package name, the mingw32pthreadsw32dev, and you select that, and, and it'll select a couple of other things, the link libraries um, that are associated with the pthreads as well. But if you have that, then you should be able to compile and run, even on, on Windows. Um, so in, in particular, um, you should be able to do a make clean, and then, then a make, and then that will create the executables here. So. Um, and, and get, if, if you get an error, if you can't find pthread.h header file, it means that you don't have the, the pthreads installed yet, all right? So let's, let's look at the program. If, if you did compile it and run it, um, this is before we have any bug fixes, um, it, it ran something like this, okay? Um, and if you run it multiple times, you'll see that you won't always get the same kind of ordering. So here we're getting a pretty regular output, but but um, yeah, I mean, right there we see that the dot ran twice. The the dots are coming from the, um, uh, the, the function, so the output of the dots comes from the thread function that this, this started, and, and the O's come from the, the, the thread that's running in main here, right? Just a refresh your memory a bit, okay? But, so what you should have, you know, if you read the uh, example discussion that I posted with this problem set, uh, basically this should be surprising um, because at, at first glance when you look at this, there, there's two threads running, but they're both running a loop 20 times, and bo both of them are just basically um, incrementing my global, okay? So if, if my global starts off initialized as zero, uh, presumably, if, if if this loop ran you know 20 times, um, you know it would fetch my global, add one to it, uh, and store that value back out there, right? Uh, likewise, the the other loop inside of main does a similar thing, although it does slightly differently. So that was explicitly what I asked you about in this question here. So the difference here is that it does it in one step um, in the main function. So it directly takes my global, adds one to that. Uh, so it reads the value out, adds one to it, and, and writes it um, back in, right? Whereas um, our function here, um, that's going to be running in a thread, first reads it out and adds one to it, but then it does some stuff, including it sleeps for a long time before it actually writes the value out, all right? So um, if you've watched um, 
about the issues with concurrency video, which you should watch before this one. If you haven't, you should go back and watch those first. So what you know, um, or you should know now, is that basically if, if these two are running, threads are running concurrently, that means they're running at the same time and their execution overlaps, right? But they're making use of the shared uh, global variable, okay? So this is a shared resource or a shared piece of data. So, so both of these are reading the value out of there um, and, and doing something with it and writing the value back in, okay? So the biggest, most obvious problem happens because if I read the value out and add one to it, but um, if I, you know, get interrupted before I write my value back out, so, so if I get interrupted uh, and maybe I switch back over to the main thread, and if it runs, uh, we haven't written back out the increment. So when it reads it out, the, the work wasn't done to save the result of incrementing by one. So we're going to read the old value and add one to it and put it in there. Uh, but then when, if, if we switch back at this point, when this writes that out there, we lost one of the increments, basically. Okay, So that sequence doesn't necessarily always have to happen like that, but especially because we're sleeping for such a long time in between here, it, it's very often the case that um, um, one of the writes will get uh, lost because of that switching back and forth concurrently. And that's mainly why you end up with around 20, 21, 22 usually if, if you run this uh, program the way it was given to you, okay? So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll let it run again there. So as you can see though, you won't always get the same kind of interleaving, right? Because there's nothing that's um, enforcing any kind of order on the interleaving between you know how when it switches from this thread um, back to this thread and back and, back and forth. So, so it essentially happens at random points, basically. Okay. So yeah, we got 21 again. Um, but, you know, we got a slightly different kind of ordering. So, um, astute student um, mentioned or might have noticed and said, well, uh, it, it's because it's, it's so likely that I get interrupted in the middle, especially when I'm asleep here. So, um, if I just changed my code um, to look, to, so so you know looked much more like um, the, the 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 thread in main. So just do something like say my global, you know. So so you know what, what happens if you change it? Does this fix the problem? Right. So now the, these are both essentially running the same code. So this just reads the value out, adds one, and writes it back in. Um, prints out a little bit of stuff and goes to sleep and does it again. Right? Same thing as what um, um, we're doing in our main thread. Okay? So, let, so let's try compiling that and running that and see what we get. So, um, um, So I gotta check my make build there. Should have rebuilt that, or did I not save? Oh, I didn't save. That's why I didn't rebuild it. There we go. So now that I saved it, of course I just did a make clean. Uh, so we'll rebuild everything. But um, all right, so, so let's run it again and see what the result is. All right. So here, both loops are running, you know, 20 times. Again, there's nothing that will inf that will force it to to strictly alternate between the two so you know sometimes the, the the function can run twice in a row but yeah we did it we fixed it right looks like we did so we got 40 which is more like what we would expect right um but um let's for example so the the the, the sleep here uh, well, now that we've gotten the sleep out of the middle of the reading and the writing update, doesn't make as much of a difference, but uh, let's try it. Uh, certainly our, our program will run a lot faster, right, if we, if we get rid of that sleep. So if we do that, it'll just do these in kind of tight loops. And probably what I'll expect to see, so, so here's another kind of good thing to do. So what would you predict would change here, okay, or what might you see, right? Uh, because um, there's a lot less opportunity, so when it sleeps, that is often an opportunity for the operating system to regain control. So uh, the sleep is basically going to cause the, the, the process to block, 
and the operating system will regain control and, and will probably switch over to the other thread. So without this, I mean, it's very likely if we're only running 20 times, it might run all 20 of one of these before it, it, it blocks and runs to the, and, and it does the other one, right? Or you might see it run 10 or 12 times or something like that. So let's, let's try that. Let's see, I saved it this time. So if we run it, it only recompiles that one. So, so yeah. So, uh, so my very first time, it ran all of the, the main function and then all the others. Uh, this time we did get a little bit of interleaving, so, so it runs you know, quite a few before it switches over to the other. But, uh, but we're always getting 40, which is good, all right? Okay. But is it really fixed? So that's kind of my question for you. Do, do you think it's really fixed yet? What if I'm going to um, um, improve this program a little bit? So let's make a global variable called numLoops. Um, and let's do a, a thousand. Okay. So instead of doing twenty loops, um, I'm going to change these to do both to do a thousand loops. All right. All right. So let's try. It. So now instead of doing you know forty loops total, we would expect to get my global has a result of what a thousand plus a thousand or two thousand. Although we'll get a lot more output, so um, but yeah, we get 2,000. Do we always get 2,000? Yeah, pretty much. Although we get some different patterns of interleavings, but um, so let's try a uh, hundred thousand. So so we should get 200,000, right? What happened there? 109, so we, we end up 20 less. Just one less that time, but still, we didn't get 200,000 like you would expect. Oh, we got 200,000 that time, but notice we don't always get that. So we, we were 17 short that time, just two short that time. So, what what's happening? Can you guess what's happening here? All right. So the, the you know, the, the main... Um, problem here. The, the main thing to realize is that these statements, although they're they're kind of atomic looking in C code, these get compiled down to machine code that looks something like this. So, so this is like load register A from from whatever address in memory holds the my global variable, right? Uh, and then we do something like an add um, one to A. Okay, so I, I can't I can't quite remember my my 64, uh, my, my um, Intel um, machine code, but um, so load add and then like a store A back to my global. So if you were to actually look at the output of the compiler of this function, it would look more like this, okay? So essentially the problem is, that, so we didn't really fix the problem. We made it much less likely to occur, but if, if you run it enough times, sometime it's going to get interrupted you know, after we've loaded and, and added, but before we've stored the result back out, and it will, you know, the, 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 the operating system will switch it over to the other thread. And whenever that happens, so it, whenever we get interrupted between the load and the add, or the add and the store, we're going to lose one of our um, increments, one of our calculations, okay? So, <coughs> it's a <coughs> classic example of a race condition. Um, or, or at least a, a common kind of concurrency bug of trying to um, work with this global value here, okay? So, what's the real way to fix this, all right? Um, so the real way is we need to use one of our concurrency mechanisms, like a semaphore, to define a... Um, um, to define a critical section, okay? So, so both of these, basically, whenever we're reading and writing the value to my global, we need to define a critical section around accessing that, okay? So the first version in the example is called uh, PS2, PS Problem Set 02 Semaphore, uh, does that, okay? So in this case, we're, we're including the semaphore.h header file in order to use the POSIX semaphore, so we're using both POSIX threads and POSIX semaphores, okay? So the way you use a POSIX semaphore is POSIX semaphores are defined as a structure, 
or you can think of also this kind of like a class uh, called sem underscore t. That's the semaphore structure. And this is this is an implementation of a basic counting semaphore like we talked about um, in um, our class, in our videos for this class, okay? So, um, so I can scroll down here. So, so you have to um, initialize this semaphore um, and, and the, the, the function to initialize, uh, you don't have to worry about the second parameter, but the third parameter basically is the count value, okay? So we're going to initialize our counting semaphore to one so that it's initially unlocked. And, and the first um, thing that calls a sim uh, wait uh, will enter immediately and decrement our count variable to zero, all right? Um, in this code that I gave you, I, I changed it a little bit uh, because I really needed to have both of the main and the, the, the function running as separate threads that are done by pthread create. So now in this code, uh, there's two functions called thread function and thread function two, uh, or I think I call it thread function one and thread function two later on. I should, I should have done that there. So, uh, or, or uh, better, yeah, I should probably call these in anticipation for the next version of this code. I'll call it thread function zero and thread function one. So think of thread function zero as the, as originally the code uh, in the thread function. Okay. Um, so so this is uh, right now I've left it exactly like we had um, in our thread function. So it, it reads the value out of my global, uh, adds one to it, um, and then uh, writes it back out with a sleep in between there. Though okay, so so notice though that we're now using the semaphore. So before we do any of this code and and. For, for the, the thread function zero here, we have to consider the whole thing a critical section because we access my global and then we write it back out. So, so we have to have the, the lock and the unlock around um, all that code there, okay? Um, and we recall this from thread function one. Um, actually, maybe by the time you um, watch this video, I'll have fixed this already in the repository. So, so I'll probably push these changes back out um, after I do this video here. So this is basically the code that was in the main function, but we're running it in a second um, thread. And again, the only thing we've done that we've changed now is that we've got a semaphore, and both of these we do the, the wait, um, and um, the, the signal is called simpost uh, for the POSIX uh, semaphores here. So simpost is what we call a signal or, or semaphore signal um, in our textbook here, all right? Um, So let's try that out. So, so does that fix the problem? Okay, so, so if, if we try it, let's rebuild it. Um, so, and and um, that did not rebuild this one here. Um, there we go. So we've rebuilt our piece, the, the semaphore version. And we'll run it. So I still got the sleeps in there. So uh, notice. Um, so I'll talk about this later. So notice uh, only the thread zero, the, the one that was originally in the function, is running. So so it's all it's running um, this loop twenty times. Um, and then when it's done here, uh, it, so, so it never switches from this thread. So, so it just runs this thread twenty times, even though there's a sleep in here. Um, uh, but then eventually we come over to the, the thread here, okay? So I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but if you rerun this, you'll see that sometimes you can get a little bit of interleaving when you're only doing 40 with the sleep in here, okay? But let's, you know, so, so as, we, as we know, just the simple fix or the simple thing of if I change thread function zero um, to look like the other function, this and another thing that we can do now that we've done that so for both of these really the only thing that's critical is when we're accessing the global variable so we could move um, Could move our critical section. It's always good to make your critical section as small as possible when you're doing concurrent programming like this. So, so we could move the critical section for both of these, and we didn't even have so uh, even I, before I changed th this one um, um, was only you know doing the um, uh, 
the increment in this one statement here. So I could have I could have written my critical section for this one like this uh, even in the first place. Okay. So both of the code are basically the same function now, even though I've got it in two different functions. It's just that one outputs O and one outputs dot. There's our only difference here. All right, let's run that. So it's a bit slow with the sleeps, running 40 times. Um, but uh, notice uh, we get better interleaving now, right? Because basically um, uh, we're only in the critical section for a bit of time, but we're also hitting the sleep outside of the critical section for both of these. So that gives it a chance for the uh, operating system to regain control and to switch over to the other one, right? And, and we get uh, a result of 40, okay? And uh, if you ran, ran that multiple, many times you would see, I mean, it, 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 it'll always work, but this isn't the real test. So the real test is, let's get rid of these sleeps um, and run it lots and lots of times, all right? And in fact, I'm also going to get rid of this output to make this even tighter for these loops here. Um, so before, even with 100,000 with, with 100, for both of these loops, Um, so at a hundred thousand, we would we would often see even with the uh, you know changing the function that we would still you know get a few lost um, operations, right? So let's try it now that we have the semaphore guarding our critical section here. Uh, we'll start right off with a hundred thousand. See what we get. Okay? And since we're not outputting any any um, anything to standard output, uh, it ought to be pretty quick to, to return. Okay, so we got two hundred thousand. So I keep running it. I keep always getting two hundred thousand. Okay? So we, we got a pretty tight critical section here. Um, I mean, you know, maybe we need to go bigger, like a, a million. So you saw a little bit of a delay there, but that's, you know, we're getting two million, right? Which is what you would expect with a million. So get a million from each loop, so get a total of two million. Right? Although there's just a slight delay with two million, but, but uh, you know, see, you can still see it's pretty quick. So let's try, um, it's 10 million, 100 million. I think that we'll be fast enough so we don't have to wait around for it to do 100 million. So we should get 200 million. Uh, 200 million as our result here, right? So, did I go too big here? Let's see how long is this going to take? Um, yeah, let's uh, let me step back that a little bit. Uh, I should try this before, so. We'll do 10 million instead of 100 million. That shouldn't be too bad. There we go. But but uh, but yeah, that's that's 20 million there. If you can't quite see the all the zeros there, which is what we would expect with two loops running 10 million each time, right? So um, so anyway, I mean th this really does fix the concurrency issue here. So by protecting um, our access to our global variable with a, um, a semaphore, you know, to, to, to define the critical section, we ensure that, that this global variable always gets updated each time that we do this here, all right? Um, And real quickly, just one more thing. So it turns out that 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 p threads, or sorry, the the the, the semaphore um, in in the POSIX semaphore uh, isn't a strong semaphore. Okay, so the reason why, uh, even though I was using sem weights here, uh, the reason why when I first ran it, where we had the sleeps in there, and and it ran all of, of thread function zero followed by all of thread function one, is because uh, since, since it's since the semaphore isn't a strong semaphore, it wasn't you know there's no queuing mechanism, so when it did a a, a, a wait, um, 
um, it, it would have the lock and then it would go to sleep here, but it would still have the lock so the other process wouldn't get woken up. It would still be waiting um, um, for the semaphore. So what would happen though is that after the sleep it would turn and jump, jump back up um, and it would never switch over to the other process, okay? Um, so I wanted to kind of show, it turns out, um, as far as I could tell, there, there's no, in POSIX, there's no kind of easy way to, to make a strong semaphore, so you have, kind of have to roll your own. Um, so there, there's a couple of different versions, so there's one called uh, semaphore condition uh, using what are known as condition variables. Uh, but I just want to show this, so if, if I can bring up a slide real quickly. Um, so this is one of the last slides from the, the last of the three videos I gave. So this is an example of how semaphore, a strong semaphore might be implemented on an operating system using the, um, uh, the machine instruction, like a compare swap that like we've talked about. So you'd basically have a flag that you would use um, that you could do a compare and swap instruction on to, to create a critical section. And all the code in your sim weight and your sim signal functions would be critical sections. And then you would do the things that we talked about. So the weight would decrement the count um, and would uh, check if, if the count has gone negative. That means that um, the, the semaphore is already locked, so we need to um, block this process. Um, and if we wanted to do a strong semaphore, we'd have to have some sort of a queuing mechanism. So we, we would push, push the process onto the queue and then block. Okay? And then on the corresponding signal, um, after we increment our account variable, if the count was still negative or zero, that means one or more things are waiting currently uh, um, on the queue, so we would handle that. So, so we'd find the thing at the front of the queue that's been waiting the longest um, um, and uh, unblock it, so send it a signal to unblock, okay? So um, if you look at the, at the code in the, for example, the the problem set zero to semaphore condition, um, we can basically implement our own sort of strong semaphore using the POSIX semaphore. Actually instead, so, so we define a structure. Uh, we use a, a mutex, uh, which is a mutual exclusion instead of a semaphore. Mutex is, is you can basically just think of it as a binary semaphore. So we're going to be using that instead of the, um, um, instead of like the, um, um, the compare and swap machine instruction, uh, we're going to use this uh, mutex to be our lock and unlock um, around the critical section, which is our weight and signal functions for the semaphore that we're building. Um, now we're basically going to use a standard template queue um, as our weight queue. Um, and, and basically all of our threads, we'll just give them a, an integer ID, a thread ID, and we'll put that under the queue um, and we'll pop it off. And we have to use, we have to have some sort of a signaling mechanism. So in order to unblock, whenever we do a signal, we're going to um, send, uh, using these condition variables, um, send a sig signal to only the, the process that we take off the front of the queue to unblock it, okay? So anyway, if, if you look at, um, like the implementation of weight, it'll look basically like that pseudocode for how the operating system might implement um, a strong semaphore using um, the, the machine instructions, okay? So, so we protect it using our mutex um, to, to, to give a lock around our whole function, like the sim weight here. And then the sim weight basically is, so we pass in the, the structure of the semaphore, um, so same way, we decrement that um, and we check if we've gone negative, which means that the, the, the thing that was trying to use the semaphore to enter into a critical section um, needs to be blocked because the, the semaphore is, is locked, okay? So we, we push um, that thread onto the queue and um, then we use, we, we wait on this condition variable, okay? So this will cause the process to basically block uh, uh, waiting for somebody to signal the condition variable here, which is what we need it to do. So we need to wait until we get a corresponding signal sent only to this particular process, okay? Um, and then if you look at the sig signal, so we do the opposite, so we, we increment the count, and if the count is still negative or zero, that means that one or more things are waiting. So what we want to do is we want to find the thing that's at the front of the queue waiting to enter our semaphore in order to implement a strong queuing discipline and, and take it off the, the queue. And then here's how we 
use these condition variables to signal. So the thing that we took off, we, we, we find this condition variable by its thread ID. So, so we'll get the thread ID off the queue, then it'll tell us which condition variable it blocked on, it, it was waiting on, so that we can signal at that condition variable and wake it back up. All right. So, um, so anyway, you can play around with that. Um, the um, um, So here we've still got in the, the code where we have the sleeps. So, so then the rest of this code is the same as what I was just showing you. So we still have in the code where I have the sleeps. But now you'll see since we're using a strong um, semaphore, so, so now we're using our semaphore uh, implementation, uh, although we called it the same here, so, so it looks pretty similar, but, but we're calling our, our own sim weight and our own sim signal functions. Uh, but, but now it will um, always alternate the um, access to the semaphore since the uh, since, since the weight um, needs a strong queuing discipline here. Right? So even with the sleeps, um, um, as soon as we hit weight, we get put on the queue, um, and then whenever when we do signal, the next thing that's been waiting the longest on the queue will run, and that will allow us to successfully alternate back and forth between these two uh, threads here. Um, okay, so that's basically it for this video here. Um, as we're kind of letting that, and, and you know, I want to show you that we, you also, we also get the correct value for my global still. Right? Um, so that's basically it for you know how you fix that concurrency uh, bug that we first saw in the problem set two. Hope that helps you understand a little bit about how semaphores and concurrency mutual exclusion mechanisms work. Um, and yeah, that's it for this video, and I will see you guys then in the next video.